And the message today is entitled, The Great Demonstration. Well, tomorrow is Easter, and across the Christian world, the story will be told and retold again of the rising of Jesus from the dead. It's a familiar theme. We've all heard it before. But I wonder if we really know what it means. Remember the theme, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw the stone and then rolled away, and an angel of the Lord said, He is not here, for he has risen from the dead. Of course, the eternal question of Easter is, what does that empty tomb mean? Incidentally, it means that there is something eternal about life that transcends death. In the years to come, science may well reveal the process. But fundamentally, it evidences a principle that we may well have overlooked in the knowledge of the universe, in the evaluation of ourselves, the principle that makes all healing, all overcoming possible. We've been considering over the last two weeks my book, Discover the Power Within You, which deals with the concept of the divinity of man. And my thesis is that this was the essential message of Jesus. He taught that life is for living, not dying, that life is lived from within out, that there's a great depth to life within you, within every person. We may not understand that depth, perhaps it is unknowable, but in the resurrection we can know that there was no magic or trickery involved. It was a great demonstration of the deep potential within every person. Central to Jesus' teaching was his concept of the kingdom of heaven. He said it was within everyone. This kingdom is not another world, but another dimension of life. The word heaven means expanding. It is like yeast. It is like the miracle of the seed. And these are illustrations Jesus used in trying to explain it. It's a dynamic within every person that is forever rising, guiding, transforming the very key to the fullness of life. Heaven is a rhythm of life, the beat that goes on no matter how conformed we become to this world. Easter simply demonstrates the promise of the rhythm of life. Healing is an evidence of it. Prayer works with it. An affirmation declares it. Positive thinking works because of it. And because of this kingdom of heaven within, which is the resurrection principle, health and healing are natural. It is why man has the built-in will to live, the will to fight off discouragement and despair and futility. It is why hope springs eternal in the human breast, as the poet says. Because of this resurrection principle, man is a restless creature who longs for the heights and who cannot settle for anything less. The parable of the prodigal son reveals the bursting forth of the rhythm of life. It is a counterpart of the Easter story for sure. Here he was out in the far country living riotously, involved in a life of sensuality and materiality, and then suddenly he becomes a new person. What happened to him? Life happened. The innateness of life broke through. As a seed breaks its shell and germinates and grows into the flower, it can be. We should remember that the first urge to run away into the far country was also the activity of this same force within. It was the urge for growth and expansion. He had to run away that he could come back. It's important to understand that Jesus was experienced life happening to him, not only on Easter morning, but all the way right up to the seeming end. He had caught the rhythm of the upward progressive sweep of life. When he said, follow me, he was talking as an older brother who knew that he was not only pursuing his own goal, but making a trail for us all to follow. It's really too bad, in my view, that we have put Jesus on a cloud where we can't understand or identify with him. He was a person. He made the overcomings along the way, not because he could not fail, but because he would not fail. He was no ordinary man, but he was a man. He was called master, not because of the manner of his birth, but because of the victorious overcoming through his life. All along the way, he was involved with his own self-mastery. So Easter morning was a kind of commencement day for Jesus. He had made the great demonstration. He had proved himself by journeying into the beyond and back. He had demonstrated more than the overcoming of his own life. He had also verified the principle of the divinity of man, which means you and me. We downgrade Jesus when we think of Easter as a miracle of God instead of seeing it as the demonstration of the depth potential of man. Remember Jesus' words, all that I can do, you can do too if you have faith. Man can only be explained in terms of his potential, the person he can be. Despite the confused religion about Jesus with its rituals and creeds and holy days, Jesus simply taught and demonstrated what man can be. Easter proves the truth that one can become what he innately is, and that this innateness 
is far transcendent to anything we have ever conceived of in our wildest flights of a man's imagination. Easter proclaims that there is a man of genius within every person of mediocrity. We've been told that genius is born, not made, and it's true. But what we've overlooked is that a person dies and is born again many times in his life through the human experience of growth. There's a real-life genius within you struggling for releasement. And if you can get into the spirit of Easter, you can believe that the stone of limitation will be rolled away from your tomb of human consciousness. Oh, you'll have to study and work and discipline yourself. And we certainly misunderstand Jesus if we fail to note the commitment and discipline of his quest. But you can achieve, you can overcome, you can fulfill your uniqueness. If the Easter story were simply a play, the author could hardly have chosen the characters more imaginatively, because it was Mary Magdalene who was at the tomb when it all happened. It was Mary who had the vision of angels telling her of the meaning of it all, and it was to Mary that the resurrected Jesus appeared with the instruction to take the message to the others. This is the Magdalene who was the loose woman taken in adultery, and who became a committed follower of Jesus after life happened to her. Why had not John, the beloved disciple, been picked for the role, or Peter, or one of the other disciples? Actually, when Mary brought the news of the open tomb to Peter and John, they scoffed in disbelief. No, the key to the scenario had to be Mary. And in the light of ensuing events, and of the Christian movement that began with the resurrection implication, it could be said that the most important single figure in the evolution of Christianity was Mary Magdalene. Now, this is significant. It is said that the chain is no stronger than its weakest link. But a broken link, when welded together, may well become the strongest link of all. Perhaps on that Easter Sunday morning, Mary was the strongest of them all. This should get hope to all who work their way back from fallen times. On the cross, Jesus gave the assurance of eternal grace to the penitent thief. And in Jesus' story of the prodigal son, the young wastrel, after he had come to himself, was preferred over the older brother who never went out, but who harbored envy and resentment. Note also the scripture account that says, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, toward the dawn, the human tendency in times of trial and misfortune is to look toward the west, to indulge in regrets from that which is fading from sight. The disciples were looking toward the west. Jesus had fired them with enthusiasm and hope, but it was all over now, for hadn't they seen him die? Significantly, the word Easter contains the word east. In Oriental lore, east is a symbol of the within, of transcendence. Looking to the east means looking away from appearances, looking to God. Easter should be a time of illumination. It should be, in a sense, a sunrise service when the light of a new day reveals new hope, new promise, a new awareness of potentialities. In the Upanishads of India, we read, Lead me to the other side of darkness. This is the great need of mankind today. We have been living in the consciousness of the human, the material, the surface of life. We've become too westernized. We've accomplished great things with the intellect, but without the understanding, we've become possessed by our possessions slaves to our creations. We need to look toward the dawn, to the east, to the within, to essences of life that are non-material. Mankind needs to come to itself, to roll away the tomb of limitation, because in a very real sense we become mesmerized with that which is not really life at all. The eternal message of Easter proclaims today, look toward the dawn. Let Easter happen to you. Turn about and face the sunrise, the light of a new day. Let the resurrection principle rise up in you, that you may rise triumphant over every trial. This is what Easter is all about. This, in a sense, is the concept of what Jesus taught and what his life meant. There's a poem that's a favorite of mine, and it's become traditional to use this poem on Easter. It's a poem written by my dear friend James Dillett Freeman at Unity Headquarters. It goes like this. Small bulb, I hold you wrinkled brown and cold in my hand, I would understand the power in a flower, how from death only life can come. Oh, what a reaching for God there is in clay and clod. I feel you, earth, straining for birth. Splinter my rock of doubt and let Christ out. Put forth your tenuous pale root, your fragile trembling shoot, your frail green leaf, your blossoms brief perfection, trumpet of resurrection. Small bulb, your bloom, rolls back the stone from the tomb.